Let's talk about the roster construction hack that can help you win the Superflex Best Ball Tournament over at the FFPC. That is what we're going to talk about on today's show, as well as talk a little bit about maybe what the dust settled with the time passing in between, maybe what we would change about our draft versus the Road of His Overtime listeners. And Sean, that doesn't just include our 20th round pick that was Darren Waller, but uh, I do think for the you know the bet value and the you know the the joy that it gave our listeners over the course of the last week the darn waller pick i think was well worth the investment even though if that means that we now no longer have him on the roster for competition purposes but we are going to talk about sean's article up on rotoviz.com of course if you are signing up at rotoviz.com you can use the code rv radio 2024 at checkout to get yourself a 10 percent discount of a rotoviz nfl pass gives you access to all of the content and tools that we discuss on the podcast but sean monday we're back in for another round off road of his ot shows i know we're going to have stadium bananas and of course you just before jumping on here have just recorded the best ball banana stand with peter Overzet. so sean siegel well and truly getting as much out there as well as two articles up on rotaviz.com over the past couple of days so it seems like it's been a pretty busy week how are, how are you feeling here good it's been a lot of fun i mean i <laughs> we all get into this because we love fantasy football and so for me the last week has been a bit of a party i you mentioned the draft with peter overs that i think that we got our best and maybe most interesting team we had the 106 we got some pretty large adp values which can be difficult to do in bbm and the team fit together very nicely encourage everyone to go over and check that out if that's the kind of thing you're interested in, again obviously don't want to waste your time or jam up your device otherwise but if that is something that appeals to you also you know would love to have you subscribe to that particular feed Colin, we got a lot of interesting feedback from the ceiling banana shows that ben and i did last week those were a lot of fun looking forward to recording with him again likely tomorrow but i want to again thank all of the participants of our FFPC Superflex draft. That was so much fun. We are going to do a few more of those column. I also want to kind of throw it out there that, you know, if there are people interested in doing a dynasty startup, it's, you know, probably only, you know, 15, 20, 30% likely to do that, but they should reach out to you. Uh, let you know if that's something that would appeal we had a lot of fun with that draft column the main thing that did kind of come into play at the end was a difficulty finding the tight end down the stretch um that was maybe my least favorite pick in fantasy football history and it didn't turn out uh, to take too long for you know that to completely come to fruition so we're gonna be going with 19 players on that roster do you remember the person we were most looking at in terms of the guys who were subsequently drafted, Isaac Garendo, someone I think we did talk about, Damian Pierce, another player who was drafted down the stretch that I was very interested in. <laughs> Obviously, those players would have done a lot more for us. I do like the fact that we have Dalton Kincaid and Kyle Pitts up there at the top. We're going to get plenty of tight end scoring. The overall tight end scoring should not be the issue. But as we work through this, one of the things that I want to note is we did a, a full show on this idea of kind of a, a star and then scrubs QB approach, that foundation QB approach in Superflex. But one of the things that I that we kind of neglected to go into detail on in that show, uh, which again stemmed from <laughs> my not having worked through all of the elements there and the roster construction explorer yet to finish that article up is that there's a, a secondary thing that you definitely want to do and that jumps out in a huge way if you use the rce if you use the best ball explorer and column i i just don't think there are that many things out there that you can kind of play with and get deep into the weeds on that are as much fun as the best ball win rate explorer so if you're a heavy ffpc drafter i think that's something you just absolutely have to have it was so much fun working with it on this particular article the most interesting thing here and i think it does very much echo everything that we've talked about with zero running back over the last decade 
is that if you get into a draft and you're in a format where one position is either so much more valuable than any other position, or there's the perception that it is. If you have a pick at the end of the round and you're chasing what drafters did early on, then you're setting yourself up for very poor results. And this is something that we do see when we pull up the positional heat map in the best ball win rate explorer. So one of the things that you can see is that drafting a QB early has been very effective. Now, one of the things I do want to say is that that comes back to specific players. And so similar to the elite tight end discussion, when you're looking at quarterback, the results of specific guys and the injuries or not to very specific players is going to have a huge impact on the shape of the scoring and what works in any given season. But I that do was think a that question the, that I was going to, and you might be going to answer now, but specifically with the win rates and the players. So we've seen it, you know, for a couple of seasons with Christian McCaffrey having, you know, an impact on the win rates of his draft slot pretty much. But when we look at the elite quarterback options here and, you know, let's say Josh Allen or Patrick Mahomes or whoever it may be in those given seasons, the that is, I think, a much bigger skewing point in Superflex than it would be in standard leagues. Is that something that I'm overemphasizing or do you feel that's correct? That with these elite quarterbacks and the hybrid profiles, the differences between the, the haves and have-nots is, you know, it's drastic. Yeah, and you, you set it up so perfectly there. And so I think the... The main takeaway that I want to put as concisely as possible, (laughs) as opposed to rambling on for another 10 minutes, is to say that as you go through the first round, the win rates collapse. And the reason for that is that you've had such a big gap, essentially between Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, and everybody else. And you have Patrick Mahomes in one of the seasons that we're focusing on also scoring big from early on. And then you have a lot of QB entries. And so one of the things that I note at the end of the piece is that the health or lack thereof from the big time hybrid quarterbacks is going to play a huge role in what we actually see as the dominant tactics for 2024. And so specifically the guys you're looking at there, Lamar Jackson, the 105, somebody who did stay healthy last year, but it had problems in the previous two seasons. You have Anthony Richardson at the 108, who missed almost all of last year. You have Kyler Murray at the 204, who has missed huge chunks of seasons and has generally played well when he's been healthy, but just hasn't been healthy that much over the last several years. You have Jaden Daniels at the 301, where this is a very specific sort of instance where if it weren't for the fact that he is slender and takes a bunch of big hits, he would be even much more expensive. Now, I mean, he's expensive, right? People do think that he's going to score, even though he's a rookie in what could be a very bad offense, or at least a a mediocre offense in terms of what people see as the ceiling. If you have a mediocre offense as your ceiling and you're going early as a rookie QB, then you have to have some things that really balance that out and give you upside. Well, Jaden Daniels has those things, but my argument would be that if people weren't terrified about his chances to stay healthy, then, I mean, he would cost essentially what Anthony Richardson costs because, I mean, he's basically Anthony Richardson who's not a terrible passer, right? So the risk there is baked in to an extent. People... Are concerned about that and then you have Caleb Williams at the 305 and that one I wanted to go ahead and include because I do think that Williams has meaningful upside as a rusher but in the rookie 101 series we also discussed why you know maybe it might not be as high as would be ideal for fantasy but those guys their ability to stay healthy and score is going to dramatically impact fantasy football and especially super flex because the hybrid profile gives them the ability to be difference makers in the way that maybe the pocket pocket passers just don't have other than the most extraordinary of situations for the pocket passers to do the same things. They have to have, 
you know, MVP type of seasons. Whereas the hybrid guys just have to stay healthy, <laughs> right? So that's why we have the ADPs distributed in that way. Colin, when we were looking at our potential options, Anthony Richardson was someone who was pretty interesting and did go one pick ahead of us at the 108. We took Brees Hall at the 109. Then you have to kind of wrap back around. And one of the things that happened is that both Eric and Columbus Green Bay playoff beard avoided QB. And that's something, again, that the, and I discussed this and showed the visual in the article, the positional heat map very strongly suggests that that is the right play. And there are a variety of reasons for it. One of the things that was kind of interesting, Matt Irby had a fun article recently talking about the value of getting the absolute stars and how quickly things fall off from that. And so when you look at these teams at the 11 pick, you get Tyreek Hill and then Bijan Robinson coming back. I mean, you may have the wide receiver one and the running back one on that team, and they may not just be the one, one, wide receiver one and running back one, but they could separate from the rest of the group. If that is the case, then Eric is you know in fantastic position to then build off of that with everything else that happens on that roster. You look at the picks from the 112 and Justin Jefferson and Amon Ra, St. Brown, both of those guys, I mean, Jefferson, obviously the superstar, Amon Ra, the incredibly high floor. You get Achan in round three with Jerry Goff at the 401 and Goff in a situation where you know, his ADP is in the middle of the third round. Again, you're setting yourself up there with a lot of floor and then big time ceiling as well if the picks hit. The Roster Construction Explorer definitely encourages you to go about it that way. And I like the fact that the drafters who had the 11th pick, who have the 12th pick, didn't chase in those first two rounds. With us, when it comes back, you know, we had the option there of taking a Gibbs, taking a Nakua or Wilson, or doing the other thing that, again, I we sort of discussed not doing. I think that there are reasons to have not executed it this way, but we did go ahead and take a hybrid QB and we were looking specifically at Murray and Daniels. I think either one of those guys are a solid pick there. I do think we're going to have lots of opportunities to take Daniels down at the two, three turn, which is where he did go in this draft at the two eleven. thoughts on how that element sets up when we see all of the, historical evidence here favoring this I, mean, I think people in some ways see it as a more conservative approach or maybe they see it as a more gunslinging approach but it's a definitely a more fun approach when you get out there and you get the superstars i love the fact that the 111 and the 112 didn't reach for the quarterbacks yeah and i i love what they've done throughout a lot of this build you know the team in 11 has got Caleb Williams but they also have Keenan Allen, Cole Komet and DJ Moore so they've really built out on their you know Lions bet in this one but the team in 12 you know Amon Ra along with Goff they have Justin Jefferson along with JJ McCarthy you know there's a lot of very nice uh, combinations throughout those rosters with our selection Sean something that we did talk about while the draft was progressing and a lot of positive feedback for people who have listened in to those draft conversations. Those are available on the Road of His Overtime podcast feed. And the other thing, just before I get into it, a lot of people, Sean, reaching out after hearing the draft, wanting to get into these future drafts. So if you are interested, as Sean mentioned earlier, in drafting against us, get in touch. You can send them my way on Twitter at Overtime Ireland or emailed across at Road of His Radio at gmail.com. But we talked about B. John Robinson, and, you know, we, again when you're in a draft room like this and obviously we're drafting against people who are listening to the show so they they may be picking up some of those ideas they may be using some of the tools on the website but when you get to the turn and you have you know justin jefferson amon ross and brown Bijan robinson something we talked about was potentially Brees hall and Bijan because of the advantage at the running back position that you can build out on this particular format that obviously those three players went then joe burrow went we were kind of in a little bit of a situation where we weren't exactly 100 percent in on some of the other names and we did discuss you know your article about the nfc west so we we're trying to build that out although it didn't really come to fruition fully for us throughout the draft so 
with the information you know in the article and, and being it something that we talked about on that preview show although we talked about it more from the fact of get the elite quarterback and then wait so you know that is getting usually in the first round that could be a case though you know when obviously you have the win rates and they they have a lot of information behind them each season changes maybe kyler murray is you know severely underrated this year has the career year and then you know his win rate next year is going to change that data a little bit but when you look at your article and you know splitting it out into 21 and 22 you've put in some additional years in some of these time frames but the quarterback in round one and then the quarterback two after round five has been hugely successful a win rate of 14 percent across those particular samples then last year uh similar you know qb one in round one qb two after round five that was 11.7 percent. so again successful but when we go down and look then at the the big thing that you know i would be looking to avoid with the sample size here and something that i did try out last year in drafts and what the injuries that didn't work out was drafting two elite quarterbacks in round one and round two and then doing two quarterback builds that didn't work out but qb1 and qb2 in the first three rounds has provided just 5.4 percent win rate which is obviously not what we're looking to do so there's like a huge amount of information built into these with a large sample size the other thing sean that i find very interesting and the, the piece was looking at the win rates from 2021 to 2023 and once you go past that kind of real elite tier of guys you know down as far as uh, josh allen you have 16.2 percent for josh allen and the group above that is 19.3 percent down to him now there is names in that that were much later picks the likes of daniel jones who we talk about quite a bit on the show and people maybe aren't the biggest daniel jones fans but he's in there parties in there herbert's in there but once you go beyond that once you get down to like the the 15 percent, there's not a huge gap and you know, it becomes quite flat in terms of, of a win rate across those and again i i'm you know looking at that it's when you go beyond that round five those quarterbacks then having that success are kind of pulling this entire group into a very similar um area of the draft but the the one thing that you mentioned at the start that we didn't really go into much about is the kind of emphasis in these super flex drafts to almost do it like a, a zero rb draft once that you know if there was an elite tier of running backs is gone don't don't continue to chase and, and change it over to uh, a position that you can build your strength at. and again the team in 11 team in 12 that is exactly what they have been able to do and although sean with how this draft played out you know if i look back now maybe we would have taken sam laporta over kyler murray for example and that might have allowed us then in round three to go williams over kincaid and then we might still get pits but as this draft progressed and, and tight end was was moving very swiftly in this particular room through those five rounds i'm still pretty comfortable with what we were able to put together um but obviously the uh the, the data would be showing that maybe not the the most ideal approach you know to, to consider but how much do you put emphasis on the win rates versus like the overall draft so you have like this draft here is not going in line with what the the win rates have been in the past but that doesn't necessarily mean that this team cannot be a team that that wins with a, a kyler murray for example in the second round right right exactly and I think that you have to look for the ways in which the player targets that you have and the logic of their format fit with what you know of historical results. And so the historical results don't define or determine what's going to happen this year. The RCE is descriptive. And yet one of the things I think that you want to do is use it to test different theories. And the thing that I dive into in a little bit more detail in the article is this element of 2022. And it was considered to be such a dynamic season for the top quarterback scorers that one of the big discussions in regular best ball for last year was, do you want to grab those guys really early and so you're thinking to yourself well if the top quarterbacks scored so well in 2022 the people then want to draft them early in regular best ball having powerhouse 
elite type uh, elite quarterbacks should show up as being the way to do it but again it's this matter of how many that you select and it has a similar element to going with robust running back where the more of these qbs that you draft early the more you open yourself up to any individual one of them that gets blown up on your roster creates a massive hole and so in 2022 you had those excellent results for a handful of guys but again it's still basically boiled down to being josh allen patrick mahomes and jalen hurts right and outside of that the quarterbacks didn't do what you needed and so if you took two of them then you almost certainly hit a landmine with one of the two picks and so that's why when you pull up roster construction explorer for that season and you look at drafting two quarterbacks within the first three rounds your win rates are below five percent and the percentage of really high scoring teams is also quite quite low that reminds us that even in seasons that superficially look good for qb what you really wanted was specific names now one of the problems of course because, is because still, as well and this that like if you don't have those specific names you're still likely to get crushed and that is like th those three names that you mentioned and hearts um Mahomes and Allen they account for 47 percent of the overall win rates in those two rounds so that obviously sh you know when you're looking at all the other picks there isn't a huge opportunity to to challenge that unless you're doing it from a, a different direction and you don't know that the player you're going to need is going to be in the top couple of picks one of the reasons that we yeah. made the finals in 2022 was that we drafted Jalen Hurts yeah. which was the guy from that 7 through 12 range of draft slot blew up and so you're going to be looking at specific names and specific profiles and drafting that in many cases as opposed to getting locked into saying okay well i can only draft a specific person from a specific draft slot that's not the way that you want to use the rce information the way that you want to use it is to understand trends and to understand what needs to happen for you to win and then you draft a team that at least tells that story and is internally consistent as it works through the thing that we drafted our team based on was the idea that Kyler Murray is going to stay healthy and blow up. And that's what we need to have happen. The fact that we got him in the early second, as opposed to paying what you might've needed to pay for him before all of these injuries, paying like the 107, 108 only means that we got a discount. It doesn't mean that we drafted a guy in the second round. So that means he's going to be a bust, but you do want to keep in mind that the historical results from that range haven't been good. So you need to keep that in the back of your mind going in and believe strongly enough that that pick makes sense to overcome some of the historical objections but again the idea here is that you don't necessarily want to have too much exposure to qb early because it increases the chances of hitting a landmine and it decreases your chances of having the other players the other stars that allow you to get things done and it creates a dynamic where you can't really afford to go back to qb in the areas that have been very successful and so that's the other problem right is that when you spend too much early you don't have the flexibility to hit on players who don't have to score as well to help you win and so when i'm looking at this draft one of the things i'm thinking is that if we don't take kyler murray in round two and, and again these things are easier to see when you can look at it and know what people did <laughs> when you're making those picks originally you don't know what decisions the drafters are going to make but Daniel Jones ends up going 810. We picked Terry McLaurin at the 804 in part to play off of the Kyler Murray selection. I mean, I would far rather have Daniel Jones, who does have an 80 pick ADP in you know the tail end of the eighth round. You well, put the, him the two V there. The, the the you know two V two there is Daniel Jones and let's say Gard Wilson versus kyler and terry mclaurin and i think in, in hindsight with knowing how the draft played out i think that's a very easy choice it's a very easy choice and then you kind of work through we were able to get bo nix in round 10. we could have and again you don't know that this is going to happen jacoby Brissett has an adp in round 17 but I mean, we could have taken him in round 18 instead of dj chark and still taken aiden o'connell in round 19 and then you have so many different ways that you can win with it right you end up with a five qb build 
in that situation. Again, that's something that the roster construction explorer tells you will work just fine. And if anything is <laughs> the preferred construction and you have some guys who could very easily be this year's Sam Howell or this year's Geno Smith, but you're not locked into just one of the two of them. You get a shot at both players. The opportunity cost for drafting some of these players right now is very minimal. The ADP for Sam Darnold is in round 15. For Aiden O'Connell is in round 15. Again, we selected him in 19, so we risked him going pretty late. Jacoby Brissett is 17. You have names like Jake Browning uh, and Joe Flacco who don't get picked at all. And again, Colin, kind of working through this, I think that those guys should go in every draft. And yeah, they're likely to not do a ton for you most of the time. But you think about you know how we approach round 20, how little value that pick has. Certainly, you don't want to throw it away like we did. But when a quarterback hits from that sec segment, even if it's just for a stretch at the end of the year, so you know you think through a guy like Jake Browning. Well, you mentioned Sean. Is, you, you're mentioning you know the success that we had with that uh, Jalen Hurts team, but that was also a Geno Smith team who was in competition with Drew Locke at that time, which obviously put him into this price of quarterback that was like it's either you know worthless or it's potentially as huge upside and that one turned out to have, have massive upside and it's the same with you know we don't want anthony richardson who's going in the first round of this to get hurt but if something happened and then you have uh joe flacco stepping in there that becomes you know a huge piece and when you're looking at the opportunity cost versus the other players being drafted here it, it can give you a, a huge edge as a you know at that point usually a quarterback four on your roster exactly so again we want to understand that the QB scoring could be different in 2024. Specific names could hit, which would shift some things around, and the entire group could enjoy a little bit better health. The health for QB uh, in 2022 and 2023 was not good. Now, the flip side of that is we don't have a lot of reasons to believe that the group as a whole can stay dramatically healthier. And it's similar to that sort of running back thesis where – you know, is there going to be another year where robust running back is the way to have played best ball? There definitely is, right? You're going to have those seasons come up, you know, maybe once every five years. And when they do, the people who kind of played it in a contrarian fashion are going to win. The question is, how do you make your teams work and how do you make your bank rolls work if you're pursuing a strategy that only works every five years? Yeah, that's very true, and unfortunately, that'll probably be a, a tough season for us, Sean, if we're bust running back is the, the way to play. But the one part I wanted to mention, you know, you talked about the zero RB element and almost, like, I think, picturing it in your mind if you're missing on those, you know, first five, six quarterbacks to think of it that way and, and go and kind of try and attack the draft from the back of the, the draft in a slightly different manner. But when you look at the win rates by position for the quarterbacks that you have in the article, you know, if we if we envision this as a, a running back version, it would be very much that like round two and round three of this super flex format are a little bit like the running back dead zone, almost like a, a quarterback dead zone in this way. And you know, then when you look at rounds, you know, five through eight, let's say in this situation, it's almost like those zero rb rounds where you're starting to try and pick up those prime targets to you know capitalize on the advantage that you've potentially built through those opening you know five six rounds does that is that something that i like to try and visualize these things is that something that you would think is close to the point or am i am i a bit off with that no and, and i resisted you know trying to talk too much about like qb dead zones in the article just you know <laughs> not you know, get overly jargony and make it confusing. But that was exactly the same, the thing that pops out is that you have this. It looks like Ryan three, three, six for running backs with all that red in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you have the first half of round one, very favorable for QBs and then, you know, sort of round five, but then into round six, seven, eight, nine, that range, very effective for quarterbacks. 
And I, I think a lot of listeners are going to be thinking just like the quarterbacks in that range don't appeal to me and they're not going to score as many points. But the situation with the QB scoring is that even the guys who are not as dynamic score in a range that works if the price also works. And they're going to have the occasional games that do exactly what you need. And if you selected players at the running back and wide receiver position early who are dynamic enough, and you've built out a team that does dominate at running back and receiver and tight end, one of the things that will be part of you know, later in this series as you kind of work through the super flex workshop is this idea that if you have good positional balance early in these drafts and you have firepower at all of the positions, then you have a roster that allows you to dominate the non QB positions, but that also sets you up a lot better for the optimized scoring of best ball at super flex than what is intuitive, right? We, we get this mindset that if I'm going to score well at the super flex and I'm going to dominate the super flex, it has to come from QB in this format. It does not. And you want to understand that as you're building out your entire roster. Yeah, it's very, and I, I will link to, to, to the article in today's show notes. Well worth diving in and having a look. We've obviously talked through a lot of it on the show. There is some more information, some charting and some details in there and visuals for you to check out. So do check that out. As I mentioned at the start of the show, if you are signing up, you can use that code RB Radio 2024 at checkout to get yourself a 10% discount off a road of his NFL pass. You get access to the tools we've talked about on today's show as well as those articles up on the website. We'll be back with two more shows coming your way this week. Make sure you are subscribed to the Road of His Overtime podcast feed to get those once they are available. Of course, you can drop a written interview on your favorite podcast app. They always help us out. That is going to do it for this edition. My name is Colin Kelly. You can follow me on Twitter at Overtime Ireland. My co-host is Sean Siegel. Check out Sean's work up on rotaviz.com. And until we are back, have a good one.